Hello, my beautiful PhD friends. So today we're gonna go over all of the tips that I think are super important for your first year of your PhD. There are some crackers in here, so make sure you look at all of them because I think you're really gonna benefit from two or three of these, which I've never heard anywhere else. The first year of your PhD is like nothing else. Like, I've never really experienced the shift of gears that I really felt during that first year. You know, you go from undergraduate and everything's kind of laid out in front of you. Like there's a pathway, you do courses, you do coursework, you do exams and boom, there you are, you've got yourself a, a degree. And then even in masters or honors year, it still is very structured. And so your PhD is the first time that I really feel like you can feel lost, you can feel like in too deep, you can feel the imposter syndrome creep up. And you know, imposter syndrome is a real thing and it's certainly something that I think every academic has felt at some point. You know, that feeling where you're just like, oh shit, I'm out of my depth, I'm gonna be found out as a fraud, I'm not clever enough to be with these people, but don't worry, they're having the exact same thoughts as you. All right, so here are my top six tips for the first year of your PhD and the things you should absolutely focus on. And uh, like I said, there's a few in there that I haven't heard before, so make sure you look at all of them. Okay, the first tip is all about reading. Read, 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 read everything you can. Read past theses, read uh, literature reviews, read papers, read anything that you can get your hands on that relates to your field of study. Now, this is one thing that I do at the beginning of every project. Now, I didn't do it when I first started my PhD as sort of like diligently as I think I should have, but after when I started my postdocs and my, my independent research and all of that stuff, um, I just spend the first, you know, maybe two months just consuming as much as I can about the topic that I'm about to study. So like I said, review papers are a great place to start, but what I find is that my mind quickly forgets which like studies relate to which parts of the field and it just becomes a massive mess. So you do have to organize the papers in some way. And for me, I found that having a PowerPoint document, right? And it's nothing fancy, just a single PowerPoint document and each slide is a paper. Um, and I put a, like in the notes section of the PowerPoint presentation, I put the DOI, um, any links that I have. And then literally I have title and then the main bit. So as I'm reading, I just type out, uh, you know, I don't know, a solar field. So it was like, this, this group has made a, uh, novel conducting polymer and it has shown an efficiency greater than something else. You know, like just very simple high level notes. Um, and the reason I do it in a PowerPoint is because if you put it into PowerPoint mode, like you put it into presentation mode, you can just flick through that so quickly. And that's what I really like about it is when like, you know, six months or a year later, I'm like, there was that study, there was that one thing where, you know, I need to have that one bit of information. I'd literally pull up the PowerPoint and just go, ba -ba 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 -ba, and just like go through it at rapid pace until I was like, ah, there it is. And I also copy and paste over any figures that are super important or I think are the main figures from that paper. And uh, the first two months I do that and it really helps. And then uh, I revisit it, not very often, maybe like once a year after that, just to add in any extra new stuff. But um, yeah, that first two months and getting all that information in an easy to consume and an easy to kind of scan format, I think is invaluable. So give that a go and let me know what you think. The second tip is all about getting your routine sorted. When you come from undergraduate, I think the tendency is to feel a little bit like in student mode when you start your PhD. Now, one thing I think that really separates mature age students from undergraduates that have come straight from uh, high school is that they just 
know how to operate in the real world. Like they've had jobs, they've had other stuff, and they just are immediately into a routine. They know what it takes, they've got the self-discipline, and I think students coming straight out of high school kind of lack that, you know, lack that kind of maturity or that awareness of the ability to structure their day and that sort of stuff. So routine is so very important. And I've talked about this a little bit before on my other videos, but I really feel like deep work is a fantastic thing to get into, you know, and because I spend my day, I've got two blocks of deep work, an hour and a half in the morning and an hour and a half in the afternoon. And this PhD is about doing those consistently. It's not about cramming like you would do for exams. It's not about putting all the effort in at the end. It's about just consistently doing something that matters towards your PhD every single day. And setting that routine and that habit early is really important. So check out Atomic Habits, the book, and also check out um, Deep Work by Cal Newport, I think. Um, but both of those are really fantastic at just, you know, allowing you to build the habits into your day where you can just keep the momentum up. I was a massive um, kind of uh, procrastinator with emails, with social media, and I wish someone had introduced me to this early on. You can still do all those things, but that hour and a half in the morning, hour and a half in the afternoon, or two hours, whatever it is, that you just focus 100% on the most important thing that day would have been such valuable advice when I was first going through the uh, first year of my PhD. So, oh, yes, go check out those, get your routine sorted and read those two books because they are fantastic. Number three, in the first year of your PhD, you should fail a lot. Like, if you're not failing, at least once a week with something, you're not sort of escaping the boundaries of comfort enough. I think as humans, as people like, and also as academics, like we really like being uh, seen as being the smart ones and getting things right. And you know, that's why we're there because we've been able to kind of show that we can learn a lot of information, pass exams, and now is where we start to come into our own. And this is where it shifts you need to take little risks with your research. You know, what happens if I do this? What if I push it a bit further? What if I try this new thing? All of these risks have to be taken. And I feel like in the early days is when they are best kind of suited because what you can do is fail. Just fail all the time. Fail like try to do something, fail, make it better, fail, you know, learn from it. There's a great thing uh, in the startup community called flurning, which is fail and learning. So fail to learn. And I feel like that first year, you should be failing at nearly everything as often as possible to learn from it. It's not gonna feel good and it's gonna feel like you're stepping outside of your comfort zone, but that's exactly the point is you learn from your failures. And in the first year, you've still got two or three years to kind of fail, 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 and hone in on what's working or find those quirks or find those little gaps of your research field where you can really make an impact. And yeah, that is something I wish I had done early on. You know, I was so sort of stuck in safety mode because I wanted people to tell me I was good or this is going great. But really the first year of your PhD is where you can spend the majority of your time trying, failing and learning. So number four is all about becoming an expert in the techniques and analysis that will enable you to sort of analyze your results better than anyone else. And this is kind of like the second step. You know, you, you in the STEM field, you kind of grab your, your data, but then the analysis step is something that I feel like a lot of people don't have a lot of support in. I know I didn't, you know, statistical analysis, trying to create graphs, what graphs matter for which bits of information. You know, I just ended up copying what other people did, but really get into grips with, first of all, the techniques, like understanding if it's instrumental based, like mine was, the scanning electron microscope or the atomic force microscope or the Raman imaging or, um, you know, any bit of, kit that really matters, go and learn it. Your first year is where, just create a crap sample, go look at it. If you've got a scanning electron microscope, you know, like just book in time regularly on that instrument just so that you get comfortable with it because you need to operate that almost like as 
confidently as you would operate a computer. And having that confidence really matters. So that's the first part. And the second part is really get to grips with the analysis. It's one thing I really struggled with during my PhD. Like I said, I knew about like bar graphs and I knew about like standard deviations, but I didn't really understand them. I, I probably don't now know what it really means. So go to see if you can understand the analysis properly. And that way, when you're reading papers and even when you're doing your own analysis, you'll just be confident with what you're doing. And a lot of non-mathematical based undergrads, you know, like chemistry didn't really have a lot. Physics had a lot, engineering had a lot. Um, and I think biology and chemistry, we kind of, you know, I did statistics for chemists, which was rubbish. Like I just didn't really understand it. I'm not super mathematically minded. Um, I did enough to get by, but that's where you need to just educate yourself a little bit better so it's not just enough to get by but you know you can really understand the techniques and what you're doing and then in your second year and third year that will pay dividends i can assure you number five is learn to say no without saying no and now th this is kind of down to essentially like negotiation skills as a PhD student, you feel like you need to be a people pleaser or at least a supervisor pleaser. And the problem is these supervisors with big egos, you know, they've not often told no within their own little um, kind of self-made uh, clan of PhD students and postdocs and that sort of stuff. And telling them no will just aggravate them. So try to say no without saying no. And this is what I mean is if someone comes to you, if your supervisor comes to you and says, um, can you fit this in or can you do this or can you train this person or blah, you know, whatever it is, you should have just a series of sentences that say no without saying no. So you can say, excellent, um, I'm happy to, but how would I be able to do that given that I'm already doing this? So it's not saying no, but it's getting them to solve the problem for you. And quite often that helps uh, get their buy-in for you not doing it. Like, so uh, another one I've written a few down here is, uh, you can say, that doesn't work for me at the moment, but uh, how about, you know, someone else does it? Or I don't quite have the capacity to do that. So it's not saying no, but it's just kind of like going around the edges of no. I feel like once you get used to those negotiation skills, it is easier to focus on what you're actually meant to be doing, which is your PhD, and not just sort of like exploring the whims of your supervisor whenever they want. Um, so yeah, learn to say no without saying no. And uh, one thing that I really like to say was, excellent, I'm happy to do that. What can I deprioritize so that gets done? Because quite often these people come to you, you know, if you're preparing a presentation, a paper, a blah, all these things, it can soon stack up and the supervisor de de definitely doesn't understand what exactly you're doing all the time. So by saying, excellent, I'm happy to do it, but I've also got these things on my plate at the moment, what should I deprioritize? That just lets them know that, oh, you've got a lot on your plate. Um, yeah, and that negotiation stuff will help much later on. So learn to say no without actually saying no. And the sixth thing that I want to talk about is get yourself something that is nothing to do with your research field, with academia, with academics at all. Now, I've always had this hobby. It's called uh, Samba, which is a Brazilian percussion group that I've played in since I was 11. Every job, every city, everywhere I've been, that uh, has, you know, has got a reasonable population has had a samba band that I've joined. At the moment, I'm the musical director of Sasamba, that's S-A Samba, so southaustraliansamba.com.au, go check it out. Um, and it's a fantastic way for me to release and get away from just normal everyday things. So I know that in universities, they try to encourage you to join uh, like societies and clubs and that sort of stuff, which is fantastic. But what I found is that I needed something to take me outside of the academic bubble for me to realize that it's not the end of the world if I don't get this grant or this paper. Um, and so meetup.com is a fantastic place where you can find common interest groups to just explore and chat and be nice. Like it's just so brilliant. So 
yes, join clubs and societies and mix with people your own age. It's, it's very important, but really find that one thing that takes you outside of academia, away. It's just into normal people. Hang out with like, you know, plumbers and tradespeople and accountants and doctors. It just Anyone that isn't an academic, and it's amazing how your per perception of that world can just shift so quickly. Because when I hang out with these people, I'm like, oh, I mean, you know, my H index is blown. They're like, oh, what's an H, H index? And you're like, oh, of course, it doesn't matter in the real world. And it's a nice leveler. So yeah, go check out meetup.com and make sure that you are spending at least, you know, a couple hours a week where you're not in any academic or university focused world. So there we have it. There are my top six tips for first year PhD students. Let me know what you would add in the comments below. And uh, if this was awesome and it was great information, I'm gonna share with you so much more about the academic journey. So remember to subscribe and I shall see you in the next video.